Hey dreamers, and welcome back to Dreamers Unite, the talk show for dreamers. Well, on this show, we explore dreams. We talk about dream creation. We like to affirm our dreams and share information. And also we talk about what I think is most important, dream manifestation. How do we live our dreams? How do we live life to the fullest? Well, today I have a very creative guest on our show. Her name is Zoe Flowers. And Zoe is an author. She's a poet, actress, playwright, and contributing writer with the Huffington Post. She is the founder of Soul Requirements and Tichapa Productions. And she is my dear sister friend. She is my writing partner and so much more. And I am so thrilled to bring this amazing and courageous woman to you, Zoe Flowers. Welcome, Zoe. Thank you. Thank you. I am thrilled to have you on the show. And I think you probably, as I was preparing for this, which because we know one another for so many years and we work together, you know, we break bread together and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, I know that you are one of the most creative people. Um, for me anyway and it's been a, a thrill and an honor to work with you in such a creative and even business capacity your play ashes and we'll talk about it a little bit more in depth mm -hmm. when you came to me <laughs> with the play yes. and I was restructuring and then eventually ended up helping to write on it well the opening I was like this is not the opening to this play yes you have something else inside of you that you have to bring mm -hmm. and you looked at me she looked at me <laughs> like I had 10 heads. Yes. And she said, I have nothing left. I can't write another thing. Well, literally the next day, she wrote one of the most amazing poems to put in the piece, and I said, there's the opening. That's the first poem. Mm -hmm. Where did that inspiration come from? Well, before I say that, I want to say that because we've worked together so long, I purposely tried to hide that. I don't know if you remember. I tried I to hide yes. that opening from you because yes. I was like, if she sees it, she's going to make me rewrite it. But I, I didn't. I had nothing left. And, and, and yes, I was mad And because um, you're always pushing me. And I went to bed and I laid down and I just, the next morning I was meditating and I woke up and I just said, ancestors, give me something because I have nothing. And then literally, sometimes I hear voices just came through and I just got up and I just wrote it. And then I, I can't remember if I called, I think I called you, you like did. I always, girl, I got a new home. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and then, yeah, and that was it. I know you're doing some new work, so I don't know how much you want to share about yeah. that. And I always feel like the ancestors certainly inspire my work, your work. Yeah. Um, and certainly so much of ashes. Yeah. Where else? The ancestors, you know, I say God, we, that's what we say. Other right. people may call something else. Right. But where else do you think that the inspiration comes from? Where do you think that seed comes from? So many places. I mean, I definitely hear voices all the time. I'm definitely, I think we all do. Yeah. Um, but different things take us away from that inner voice, whether it's too much television, or if it's our iPhones, or if it's our worries, our complaints, our, those things, we shut that, that divine voice off. Yes. And I just spend a lot of time in silence, and so my door is open, always, yes. right? Yes. And so now I just have to ask. So, um, so that's it. The door is open. And when I ask for things, I get them. So poems or scripts or whatever. So um, my work is definitely divinely guided. Um, I think that the deeper we delved into Ashes, the more ancestor-driven it became. Mm -hmm. I mean, Ashes is definitely the most, well, and Road, are the most ancestor-driven things, I think, that we've created. Yes, yeah. I absolutely agree. Yeah. And like you said, I think, okay, it's time for a nugget that I just gathered and I want to share, is that we all have creative blocks, right? right? right. And like you said, sometimes you just have to ask. Yeah. You just have to ask yeah. and be in silence, I think, with yourself. Mm -hmm. And don't put pressure on yourself. Well, sometimes, right, there is some pressure, right? So how do you deal with the creativity? Because 
we do have pressure to create. Yeah. Like we worked with Brown University yeah. and we had to lovingly so yeah. create some new pieces. Mm -hmm. So when you do have the blockage happening as creatives mm -hmm. and the ask maybe isn't enough, mm -hmm. where else can you go? I think that now the I think that I'm a good writer and a good storyteller. Yes, there you go. Right? And so I can just write now. Yes. And so the pressure doesn't bother me so much. The ask doesn't bother me so much because I feel like I'm at a place where I can just, I can tell a story. Yes. So I think before when I was more insecure and I was more, I think, nervous about telling the truth mm -hmm. and maybe that's where, maybe that's what the block is, you know? Yeah. Um, I think when I was like that, then it was like, oh, I don't know. But now... I don't feel like I have anything to lose. Mm -hmm. And so I just sit down and I just write. And I, I just write what I feel. And so some things might come from the ancestors or spirit guides. I think other things come from pain. They come from the mm -hmm. news. They come from current events. They come from things I've seen. So, um, so I don't feel the pressure in the same way to create. Yes. Now the pressure is... What do you do with it once you create? There you go. That's an, so it's a new it's a new pressure. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's a, it's a new it's pressure. A good new pressure. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a different good conversation. New pressure. It's a yeah. It's a different conversation. Now I have heard you a number of times speak at different universities, um, and at Yale University, one of your starting points is to show a picture of yourself. Mm -hmm as a little girl, mm -hmm. and I think it's important for us as dreamers to know who we are. And when we come to this planet, and even before, right, we know who we are. Yeah, It's because of outside influences, chatter, all these things that come and they hit us, and they change our perspective. So you start off at Yale, and you show this picture of yourself as a little girl, and you talk about who you knew yourself to be, yeah. And then once the outside world comes in with all these influences, it changes. Can you talk to us about you as that little girl and sort of this evolution now to this more competent yeah. woman? Yeah. Yeah, I think that I'm back to that who that girl was before yes. the world told me who I was. There you go. That little girl, and probably up until I was probably like 13, I always felt like things would go my way. I never thought anything was impossible for me to do. You know, I would be in chorus and dance class and at parties. I was always the first one on the dance floor, the last one to leave. You know, I'm still kind of like that. But <laughs> but um, but then the world just came in, you know, and was just like, that's not accessible to black girls. That's not accessible to dark-skinned black girls. That's not accessible to chunky black girls. And I started to believe all that. You know, and then I started dating partners that reaffirmed all those negative beliefs. And so my world just got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, although the outside world didn't know it. Yeah. I knew it. I knew I wasn't the same. I knew I didn't believe in myself. I knew I didn't have the confidence. Yes. And so what, oddly enough, I think what reconnected me back to that was joining the domestic violence movement in 2000 and quickly being... Um, rewarded, promoted, sent all around the country doing trainings, yes. being in front of people, speaking, because before I would write my name on, you know, I'd go to poetry readings, I'd write my name on the list, and then I'd leave before it was called, because I was so insecure, you know, I was mm -hmm. so just in another story of, of who I was, but working with people, and then I went back to school, and for the first time when I was in college, teachers were like, actually you're intelligent actually you're a scholar <laughs> you, you are. actually have something to say yes. but nobody ever said that to me nobody ever nobody ever said good job girl ever not even your parents well you know my father's like old school Jamaican you know so you know it's like you know yeah good job you know and then yeah. keep it it's, it just keep wasn't moving. yeah so it just wasn't that so um so I was like 20 something before somebody said you can write you have something to say. Your voice is important. And then I started getting paid for it. So then I was like, oh, okay, okay. well. Yes. And so and so then just the more I did that, the more success you have, I think, the more confidence you have. And then 
reconnecting with you, moving here, doing all the work we did on Ashes, both of us, being at Yale, being in Arizona, traveling yeah, all so across much. the country, doing these things that we didn't go to school for. Correct. And, and having doors open for us that people who have worked their whole lives Amen. don't get to do, Amen. and we've done in seven years. So that also has built my confidence, and that poured that poured into me. Then other people started to pour into me. You poured into me. Your family poured into me. I started attracting other people. So, yeah. Well, it's a it's a journey, like you said. I think if we wanted to sum up in terms of just the creative process yeah. of it all and yeah. the inspiration, that it is a journey. Yeah. I don't think it's something, like you said, it's not always just this light bulb moment, right. but it is from experiences, it's from the divine, it's from outside, it's from inner. Right. It's a lot, but we have to keep creating. Yeah. And I think that's the thing, just don't stop. Don't stop. Yeah, don't stop. And so what gives you more confidence is to keep creating. Now you mentioned about the domestic violence movement. How did you become involved? So funny enough, I answered an ad in the newspaper back when you could get a job from the newspaper. Um, <laughs> I just answered an ad for an office manager at the Georgia Coalition Against Domestic Violence and I got hired as an office manager. And after six months, the executive director said, I think you're more than an office manager. And I literally went on vacation and came back and she was like, I have another job for you. And I just got promoted and I started doing trainings and um, I read everything that I could. We had an extensive library at the organization. I read everything I could about domestic violence. Of course, I came to the work as a survivor of dating violence in my early 20s. Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't until I went to work in the coalition that I actually realized that I was a survivor. Mm. I thought that I was just in a relationship with an angry man that wow. I was trying to help with my love. And how many of us think that? Yeah. How many of us think that we are just in a relationship yeah. with someone that's just angry? Yeah. Yeah, or it's me yeah. who's causing them to be angry. Yeah. So because of this work, you discovered yeah, and there's, of course, there's more in the book, yes. more of my story in the book, but I mean, I had to move to Georgia because I was being stalked, and I had to leave the town that I grew up in and, and all of that, and so um, so I was drawn to the coalition, and it, again, it wasn't until I started to do the work and I started to read that I was like, wow, domestic, there's a name for this thing, and it's domestic violence, and these people have been working on it for 30 years, and then I started talking to my friends, and then come to find out everybody that I knew had either grew up in it, had yes. watched it, or had experienced it. And so I just got deeper and deeper into the work. I just, you know, I just threw myself into it, and here I am, Yeah, 18 years later. 18 years later, and I think what's really beautiful is that you took your creativity mm -hmm. and you have blended that into the work to help survivors. Mm -hmm. And I've, you know, really, it's an honor and a pleasure to uh, do this kind of work that we do mm -hmm. and to share stories. Um, how has that been for you, um, being in the movement, like being able to use your work creatively um, to help and heal people? Um, I think it's the best thing about the work. Uh, it's definitely the most exciting thing about the work. It's definitely, um, because I think that for those of us that work in organizations, uh, you can get disconnected mm -hmm. from survivors. Mm -hmm. You can wind up in rooms with people who are, think just like you, talk like you. We have our own lingo. We have our own acronyms. Yes. And so sometimes survivors, um, everyday folks, aren't in those conversations. Mm -hmm. And the arts is a perfect way mm -hmm. to connect with folks in a real way, um, it's non-confrontational. Yes. And so people don't feel threatened. Mm -hmm. You are creating a safe space for people to tell your truth. And most importantly, everybody can see themselves yes. in what we've created. 
you might come to a conference, you might hear a speaker, and you might be able to look at them and say, oh, that's not me. You might go to a support group and be like, oh, my, you know, that's not me. I'm not being hit, so I'm not abused. You know, you can distance mm -hmm. yourself, you know? Mm -hmm. Art takes away the distance. It sure does. And so, so in so many ways, it's more impactful. Yeah, and rewarding. And rewarding. Yes. Sure. So as rewarding as it is, it's also, it takes a lot of energy, right? Mm -hmm. And you are a, you do healing work. Mm -hmm. And how do you fill your coffers, your emotional and spiritual coffers back up? Because you give so much, mm -hmm. right? So how do you, what are the practices that you use yeah. to do that? Well, you know, like most healers, I could get a lot better at that. Um, so I think that's this next phase um, that I'm going into, this exploration of liberation, because I hadn't done a good job of it. Every now and then I might, uh, as things got busier, every now and then I might go get acupuncture, every now and then I might go to yoga class, whereas before I was at yoga all the time, I was doing all the things mm -hmm. that you needed to do. But moving here, doing the play, doing all of these things, it became harder to take care of myself. Yes. You know, now I'm working with a healer, which is amazing. I think you're just admitting sometimes you don't know, even though you're a healer, yeah. and certainly you've helped me and my own journey and practices that mm -hmm. I do now, mm -hmm. um, but there's still things that you don't know. Yeah. And so that means you need to go, if you don't know it, you need to go and gather some information. Absolutely. Right? Now, I'm going to turn back to Ashes again. Okay. Because you really stepped out on faith. I know I kind of told you to. Yeah, you did. I forced did. me to. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I told her, quit your job. Yes, she did. We started writing this play together, and I said, quit your job and come here and let's finish the play. Yeah. Well, guess what? She quit her job, and we finished the play, like you said, and, and the things that we wanted to do actually did manifest. True. So what gave you the courage? Because many people will stand on the edge but they're too afraid to jump. So what gave you the courage? I mean, literally, you just packed up and you were here. Yeah. Uh, on yeah. my doorstep. Yeah. <laughs> well, not quite, but not whatever. Quite my <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I gave up a lot. And, and yeah. I, I gave up a lot. Like, I quit a good job. I c drove across state. Like, I sacrificed a lot to be here. And so even when I was tired or whatever, this dream was so big, you know, I had started working on what is now Ashes years, like right after I wrote the book. And then I got busy and I put it in a drawer. And it wasn't until I got sick. And then I was like, oh, I have this play. And then we reconnected. Yeah. So I had already pushed it to the side. And by the time we reconnected, I was working so hard. I was so desperate to live this dream, to yes. be a creator, because I had given everything to domestic violence. Yes. And I had nothing to show for it, really. And so this, I would literally, and you know this, I would sit in meetings and my spirit would be jumping out of my skin because I just was like, I don't belong here. I need to be in New York City. I need to do this show. I need to bring this thing to life. And so once I made, but this is how I am anyway, once I make the decision, it's not hard. Yeah. And I don't look back. For me, I just could not put my dreams aside anymore. Yeah. And I think for all of us is what we want to know is you don't have to put your dream aside. Right. You really can do it. Right. So you have your dream box here. Yes. Okay. And I forced you not to open yes. it really, even though she peeked with some of it. Yes. Um, and just to show you that really setting your intention, it can work. So let's yeah. open up a couple of your sure. dreams. Sure. Can we open the box? Yeah. I yeah, I pried them open. They were glued okay, shut. Okay, great. So, okay, so I'm an old school manifester. I've been doing this for a very long time. Yeah. So, my girlfriends and I, we used to get together and we would do things like this. So, we created these dream boxes back in it had to be 2003, 2004, and we would, you know, we would get together, we would do vision boards, we would do all that stuff. And so, mm. so this is the inside of the dream box okay. so it says star but I took the a out and I put my face in there there you so go. I just opened this so yes. this is so funny and then it says I am renewed there's a Emmy in here which it's is funny. Emmy. I gotta put my glasses on um, oh there's money in here 
There's a little dollar sign. I love it. And then I got the little feng shui coins in here. Oh, look, at there's me marrying somebody. Okay, <laughs> that's interesting. And then it says Toronto, which I've been to. Which she's been. Change. There's a crystal. It says there's more to see, create, love, and there's a BMW, but I don't want a BMW anymore. So See, sometimes our dreams, what we think we want, they do change. Yeah, they but change. a lot of that has certainly come true. Yes, so much. So I don't even know if this, I don't know. Let's see. This is, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. I don't okay. know. Can you get that one? I don't know. We'll see. Okay. So right on here. you can easily make a dream box too. It doesn't have to just be uh, crystals or whatever it is that's important to you and what you want to, oh, oh. What is the dream? Okay. Are you going to cry? I might cry. Okay. What is it? Yes, what is it? So my book was first called Dirty Laundry. Um, oh. And so it says, a wider distribution for my book, Dirty, Dirty Laundry. And there's a heart on it. Oh. Mentors that are willing to help me further my goals, obtain a job that allows me to combine all my talents and, creative, oh. and creativity, and dedication to social justice and domestic violence work, which of course I work for a national organization yes. that I get to work from home, so I get to do all this stuff. Get hired at a job to pay me enough to to spare and share, which I have. Finish my play what by year's doing? end and get it staged. Start on a documentary. Invite more love and adventure into my life. As we are journeying wow. together, and we have so many more dreams that we're going to manifest, and yes. I'm going to add some dreams to this dream box yeah. too. Oh, do I will. Yeah, let's do that. So you know that I am on this journey and you've been a huge supporter of my new television sh series, Cherry Red Sweet Escape. What advice can you give me? What advice so I can share it to uh, creatively uh, live authentically? Because you get so many people moving at you and so many moving parts. I really wanna just be able to stay authentic in the work. And I admire you pretty much the most because you are an authentic soul. So what advice can you give me to be really authentic? I think you're doing such a great job and I'm so proud of everything that you've already done Thank you. and that you continue to do. And I would just say continue to challenge yourself and to tell the truth in your stories. I would encourage you to go even further and even deeper and, and really use Cherry Red to say the things that you might not want to say like in public yes say it through through shari and through cherry yes i would say that and and be so committed to the truth of your story so that nobody can try to come in and tell us again who we are and try to tell our stories amen yeah. stay true stay authentic so no one else ever tells you what your truth is. So you have a truth too that in this book. Zoe Flowers is one of the most amazing poets ever. You're gonna have an opportunity here on Dreamers Unite to experience some of her work and her poetry. So would you read um, of from us? Would you Absolutely. do something? Okay, yes. so that's coming up next. Thank you, Zoe Flowers. Thank you. No, I love you. <laughs> and somewhere in bone, I know I am settling, and he knows I know I am settling. He could never be you of perfectly pink lip, arms firm, and competent hands that held me tight once before dropping me like laundry, and I wonder why he stays, how he stomachs transgressions and lies that ooze as if. I could tell him I'm thinking of you, that I only think of you, that it doesn't matter that you don't even see me, that I've grown anorexic waiting on scraps from your table, how that would level him. My truth would slice him like knife into warm butter and he would be forced to eat it. He would know then that he must leave me then and it would only be right for him to sojourn off, leaving me at altar to excavate his dignity tucked neatly into our bed linens. He belongs to the world of the mundane, but you are poem alive, sand slipping through memory while I pretend to home ache. And you, all sun-kissed and unattached, breeze in amused at my shame, convinced monogamy is impossible. He is meat and potato, you are white teeth dangerous, I am loosely moral, and he is settling 
for the both of us. And that's called for Anne Sexton too. This one is called Danger Men Working. Danger, men working, Emmett Till, Yousef Hawkins, Sean Bell, Oscar Grant, Huey P. Newton, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Danger, men working, Amadou Diallo, Aaron Campbell, James Byrd, Trayvon Martin, strange fruit no longer swings on southern blinds, it rots on city blocks all across the U.S., all across us, Victor Steen, Ronald Madison, Travaris McGill, Timothy Strawberry, dangerous black men walking and doing and being so dangerously black and perfect for target practice. Don't wear hoodies, don't sag your pants, don't put hands in pockets, don't take hands off steering wheel, don't reach for keys or identification, don't forget that you're black. Wendell Allen, Ramarley Graham, James Bursett, Orlando Barlow, Eric Garner, Michael Brown, Renisha McBride, Tamir Rice, Freddie Gray, all unarmed but clearly up to some shit. Don't be confrontational, don't look him in the eye, don't be an off-duty police officer, don't ask for badge numbers, don't make quick movements, don't move fast, don't move slow, don't be rich, don't be poor, in fact, just don't be Benjamin Morgan. So powerful. And this is from From Ashes to Angel's Dust, A Journey Through Womanhood. If you don't have this copy yet, you should definitely get this. That was just a little sample of her powerful work. And to close this out, on Dreamers Unite, we always play a dream game. Okay. So you brought your dream box, and now it is time to play Name It, Claim It, Own It. So Zoe is going to add to her dream box, and we already saw that it really does manifest right as we set our intention so first you're going to name a new dream and we as viewers me everybody in this studio we are all going to claim it with you so name it claim it own it first number one is you're naming your dream and Zoe is writing down her new dream number two is you claim it you can claim it by yourself but it's so much better when you can have people claiming your dream with you. So I'm affirming it with you, Zoe, whatever that dream is that you're writing down, and then we are going to put it into your dream box. And then next, she's going to own it. And you're gonna come back like you did and you shared your dream with us, you're gonna come back and we are going to see that she owns it. And then you're gonna share with us the steps that you took. I'm not even going to read it because I want to be surprised okay. as it manifests. Okay. Then she is going to share with us the steps that she took to own that dream. Okay, this is the last thing we're going to do together, Zoe Flowers. You and I are going to envision, and I want you to see, what would a world be if we all could dream? As big as we wanted mm. and we were not afraid to leap. We weren't afraid to take a risk. And we weren't afraid to say it. Mm -hmm. What would the world look like, you tell me? So I immediately see people smiling. I immediately see children like splashing. I see bright colors. I see elders breathing deeply, saying finally. I see our ancestors saying finally. They've woken up. They know they're the ones that they've been waiting for. And yeah, that's what I see. Well, I see a beautiful world and I see the fact that I'm grateful that you are one of our dreamers. Thank you for being on thank Dreamers you. Unite and thank you for sharing that vision with us. Thank you. Thank you for your poetry and we'll see you next time on Dreamers Unite.